In some ways, I'm a strange person to be giving this address given the range of expertise we have in the room. We have people who have been publishing books in open access format since before I was even thinking about uh, open access. Um, so I think that actually we have a very rich program ahead of us. Um, I also note that it would be strange if the Cambridge University librarian did not have libraries on her mind. Um, that could be problematic, so I think we can forgive her for that. I'm going to talk today uh, in some pessimistic terms about the economics of open access monographs, uh, but I'm also going to give an argument for why I think it is absolutely imperative that as a community of humanists we come together and work out ways around these economic challenges. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, a brief overview of open access for the day, um, because no matter how many of these events I speak at, um, it seems to be we often do not have shared definitions. When I talk about open access, I mean that I'm, I'm talking about peer-reviewed research, so I'm not talking about removing peer review, that is free to read online with some additional permissions bestowed to end readers. When I talk about gold open access, I mean conditions under which the publisher makes the work open access. Uh, when I talk about green, I mean conditions when a researcher deposits the work uh, with the consent in their terms and contracts with the publisher and makes it open access that way. Green may or may not be the final version of record. It can be an author's accepted manuscript, for instance, and it can come with an embargo period, but it does not have to. Uh, if I talk about gratis open access, I mean work that is simply free to read. If I talk about Libra open access, I mean free to read with some reuse rights. I'm not going to do much on licensing today, um, but Libra essentially refers to different conditions of reusability. Just going to make sure I keep an eye on the time as well, sorry. Okay, so I wanted to start with what I think is actually a massive problem, which is the question of how much it costs to publish a book, a digital book. I'm not talking about an open access book here. I'm talking about how much publisher labor is invested in the production of a book from the manuscript stage. So there's a really influential Mellon Ithaca study of US university presses in 2016 that gave a range of their costs from between $15,000 at the minimum up to $130,000 at the maximum. Now, I'd suggest we don't go around telling deans that it costs $130,000 to publish a book because they'll never let us do one ever again. Um, but essentially what you can see has happened there is that there's been a critical addition of some sort and the press has hired in expertise of a scholarly nature to work with uh, the manuscript authors on that work. So you might think that sounds high, but actually, surprisingly, lots of presses come out with the same figures. Um, it's a bit nerve-wracking giving these out. I've tried to get them correct, given that people from these presses are in the room, but I'm sure they can correct me afterwards. But Palgrave, for instance, when it sells books, goes at about the 95 pound mark, and we estimate 200 to 250 copies. So you're looking at about $19,000 for what they aim to recoup through uh, a book sale. Um, Open Book Publishers, a few years ago, published its income and the number of books that it uh, published in that year. Um, Francis Pinter gives this figure, and dividing the number of books by the revenue came out at about £10,000 per book. But Rupert has given me a sceptical look from the front of the room, so he can correct that figure um, if he feels that's too high, which I suspect he will. UCL Press, um, on revenue of about 400k, from what I've been told, uh, came to about £14,000 per book, but that's in a startup phase, so the number of titles may have been lower at that point. Cambridge has a variable book processing charge, and it ends up at about $10,000 in the middle. Um, and Ubiquity Press, a new startup uh, publisher, has an, a big book processing charge around £6,890. So most of these figures have come from Francis Pinter's article, to which I've given um, a link there if you want to see where those uh, figures are derived from. And where do those costs go? So it's very easy, I think, often to imagine away the labor of publishing, to see it as a transparent site of non-activity in which manuscripts just somehow come out the other end without investment from people's time. But actually, running any kind of corporate organization requires management overhead. So People don't realize at the Open Library of Humanities how much time I spend filing charity commission reports, ensuring our accounts are in order, just managing and coordinating different members of staff, 
legal overheads, ensuring that uh, when we have difficult conditions of, say, copyright, we give people advice that is correct. Um, we also need travel and subsistence. Uh, we have, and sorry, I can't spell subsistence, but it looks things on this slide. Um, a huge part of what we do as a press is marketing. And I'm not talking about marketing the books necessarily. I'm talking about telling people what we do, going out there, getting library support for our economic model, ensuring that actually we can continue to operate year on year and provide that service to our authors. We have memberships, different systems, say of digital preservation in the Clocks Archive, which is quite an expensive way of doing this. Crossref, Cope, Counter, which is a statistical counting uh, organization. And I think if you have three members of staff and these memberships and these travel on costs, you're looking at about 190,000 pounds a year to run that kind of small organization. You then have production costs per book. Um, I've gone for a, a quite naive thousand pounds here because it makes for nice, easy, easy mathematics. But essentially, it gives you a curve that looks something like this, which is the question of how many books a publisher can put out with those staff um, at what cost. And you can see there's actually only, with that staffing level, a very sweet spot around the 20 bookmark where you get anything uh, that isn't either overly burdensome on the labor front or prohibitively expensive on the cost per unit front. Cost per unit um, exponentially grows, obviously, as you get towards one book, where your entire costs are in that single title, and comes with a very long tail, where if you think 100 books is viable with three members of staff, you're not doing very much work to improve that or produce any kind of artifact at the end. OK. My university English department's entire book budget is £7,900, which is less than the cost of a single book by many publishers' estimates. Um, in just the contemporary fiction section of our department, we published three or four books this year, uh, and we would blow the entire book budget on a single book processing charge if that's the economic model that we adopt. This is, though, a matter of distribution. I mean, the question might come about, if I was just talking about digital costs rather than open access costs, how is it at the moment that we're able to afford books? And so I often resort to a thought experiment. Um, we probably have about 100 people in the room today for this talk, which, again, is a mathematical sleight of hand because my mental arithmetic isn't great. But assume that you have $10 each and there are 100 of you. Uh, the speaker, me, turns up and speaks for free. The venue needs $50 to cover its staff costs, and there are 40 of these kind of talks per year that you would like to attend. The subscription logic that we've had for many years, the book purchasing logic, is one where each person pays $0.50, and here's the talk. If you don't pay, you don't get in. It's a rivalrous, exclusionary way of selling this material, but it ensures that you get the payments in if you can draw the audience. This means that each person can only afford half the talks. The general public cannot necessarily attend unless they can afford to pay as well. Then we come to the proposed model of book processing charges, where you might think it makes sense. At the moment, we're paying to consume objects. If we wanted an open access environment, isn't that a service to authors? Couldn't we just invert the way we pay for this? The idea there would be that I would pay the full fee, $50, or my funder, or my university. The problem is that the speaker, or my funder, or my university, only has $10 like the rest of you. The general public and everyone else could attend, but we simply have an affordability problem and a cost concentration problem, in that one, what was once spread among a large number of people has been concentrated at one specific point in the system. That's not necessarily a problem if you work at an intensely wealthy institution. Some universities could afford to do this. Um, Carnegie Mellon's computer science department has seen a 20-fold increase in its costs for its computer science output since they moved to an article processing charge logic. They don't seem to mind because they can afford it. Um, but Backwater Community College, who wishes to improve its research standing, certainly does not have that budget capacity, even if they might believe and benefit from open access. Then there's this type of consortial logic, which uh, we've been working on at the Open Library of Humanities, and that Knowledge Unlatched has implemented most successfully in the book space. 
And what this attempts to do is to create hybrid fusion of an open access supporting business model with a library subscription style mechanism. So the idea here would be that five people, say, attend the talk and each pay $10, their full amount. And they let everyone else come in for free. So everyone could still hear 50% of the talks. I'm not saying there's a cost saving involved in that uh, matter of redistribution. Um, but you also let the public in and you get rid of all the challenging barriers that you have in the subscription mechanism. The problem, of course, is that this model is susceptible to free riders, potentially, although that hasn't been a problem at the scale we've been operating at. Um, if you start to ask for hundreds of thousands of dollars and knowledge on actually getting towards that point, you may start to hit resistance. But if you're actually looking at the lower end of the price spectrum, free riders is not a huge concern at this point, is my experience. Uh, this model also relies on intense marketing and explanation. It's very difficult to explain to paying customers why they should pay for something if they could get it for free. And it's only by uh, making the existential argument that presses cannot exist without financial support. And if we want open access and we want presses to exist and we want an economic model that works, then some kind of radical economic thought is probably what's necessary under these contexts. But this is how open access looks in a dry funding climate for the humanities. There are some questions we can ask, and it's right to ask these, even while valuing publisher labor at all times. Is the venue, the publisher, overcharging? Um, to my mind, lots of the prices that come out from different types of entities look relatively similar. Uh, there is variance therein, but they do different things. They have different uh, legacy overheads or uh, lean startup potential that makes things easier, it's, it's always a bit of give and take. But for me, the distribution of the economics is the important thing that we have to solve here. Book processing charges do not work well in the humanities, and book processing charges concentrate costs. <coughs> they also scale incredibly badly in national and international contexts. So um, looking at the data from the last REF, uh, we see there are 5,023 monographs published um, in 2013 from just the largest four publishers. And there's an incredibly long tail of publishers, especially um, in niche disciplinary areas. You know, Church Pews 1849 to 1850 was the specialism of Ashgate at one point, for instance. Um, it's that type of um, environment. So when we start to scale this up, think, okay, if we had a mandate in place for REF, what would it look like? The costs start to get quite uh, eye-watering. So taking uh, Ubiquity Press's price of a 5,000 or so pound BPC, and you're looking at 25 million pounds being the cost to publish this output. At 6,500 sort of CEP type area, um, it's, it's variable, but that's sort of close to the midpoint. Well, it was at the exchange rate when I calculated it, but obviously exchange rates change by the hour at the moment. So um, $10,000, you're looking at about 32 and a half million pounds. And at Palgrave Macmillan's price, you're looking at 55 million pounds. Now, the challenge is that the entire UK spend on monographs, according to Sconal data from 2010-11, which was the most recent I could get, was 60 million pounds. But that is split 2080 in most institutions with 20% on research monographs, 80% on textbooks and other student-facing resources. In other words, you're looking at a budget of 12 million pounds at the moment that would need to scale quite substantially to 55 million pounds if Palgrave were in charge of all the pricing on our open access books, or at least to be doubled to 25 million from the price of a lean, low-cost startup Ubiquity Press. And I've just sort of plotted this out. So this is the, that, the blue uh, graph on the left in both cases is the total Sconal budget. So you have to visualize an overlay on that somewhere between the 10 and 20, 000, 20 million mark, lower to the 10 million mark, which is what we actually spend, and then plotted that for each of the publishers against just the books published for the top four uh, in volume of UK publishers versus UK ref books in total. They're very similar graphs, but slightly different on the figures, and I can give you the statistics on that if you'd like them. So we did a, a modeling study for what it would take to implement a mandate for open access books for REF. 
And we estimated that to publish 75% of anticipated monographic output submission for the next REF, the one coming up now, would require approximately 96 million pounds investment over the census period, equivalent to 19.2 million pounds per year. Academic library budgets, as they are currently apportioned and as they are currently distributed, would not support this cost, particularly under book processing charge logic. Um, there's the DOI for that article if you want to read uh, the full study. We also noted, though, that actually this is an insignificant amount in comparison to the total UK research budget. So there is a matter of political will involved here as to how much investment the humanities can manage to summon. Um, if it were really absolutely crucial that this were done and it required the money to do it, it we're looking at about 1% of the QR total. Do we have to leave or shall we? We'll give it 20 seconds, I think, was what you said. So. It's the book processing charge alarm. <laughs> okay. I want to end, though, with... Um, I'll end to the end part of this talk with some remarks on why... I think we need to continue to think about these problems and work out ways to solve them. And the reason is that I am deeply concerned about the visibility of humanities research going forward compared to that in the natural sciences and what it does for our ability to defend our disciplines. I want to talk a little bit about researcher access. Now, researcher access to monographs is deeply conditioned by access conditions in the natural sciences. Um, it's easy to think as though um, all our budgetary walls mean that we end up with separate compartments for each of our types of research output. But actually, it's the fact that nature, cell, and so forth cost an absolute packet, and the big deal bundles in the science have eaten away at our budgets uh, that causes us to have such small monographic purchasing budgets in the humanities. Our significance has not, well, the arguments for our significance have not been well received in terms of library budget funding, although library budgets in general have kept pace with inflation just since 1986, according to um, ARL statistics. But essentially, every institution in the world has claimed that it has not bought something on the basis of cost. Uh, in some cases, like Harvard, that might be an overstatement. They to be honest, have a bank inside their university and they're making a point if they say they're not buying something on the basis of how much it costs them. For other institutions, it is a genuine lack of access and interlibrary loan is the kind of solution to which you turn. I would point out, though, that not everyone is an able-bodied researcher who can get to the British Library with any ease whatsoever. Um, I've actually been in quarantine for the last six months on chemotherapy medication um, and told that I should not be in public spaces. Getting to the library, even though I was capable of thinking, was not an option under those conditions. So I think, think about the diverse constituents who may wish to access humanities research and the fact that physical libraries are not often the best solution for everyone is an important part of our practice if we're going to be a diverse community of scholars. And the laptop seems to have frozen, I'm afraid. There we go. Well, brilliant. I also want to talk about public access to humanities books. It is a constant source of frustration to me every summer when my neighbours ask me if I'm enjoying the school holidays um, with no appreciation whatsoever that the second term is over, we all scurry away to libraries uh, if we can get there, and spend our time doing our research work. But how on earth is it that the general public don't know that academics do research? I mean, this strikes me as really problematic, given that every day on the news we see the latest scientific discoveries and somebody from a university steps up. Now, we do have brilliant public spokes figures for our humanities disciplines. Sarah Churchwell is a great example of this, uh, who really get out there in the media and demonstrate that there are people in this space but to be blunt, most people in the general public do not know that humanities researchers have to do research, um, enjoy doing research, and publish their research. 
And one of the reasons for that is that they can't get access to the material. It's not well covered in general news outlets as a result, um, and it's hidden away. Now, we have an increasingly educated populace. We finally hit that symbolic target of 50% of the population attending university in the last few weeks, according to the statistics. We have institutional missions that are about benefits to broader society. But what happens when people can't get access to this research with any ease? Um, yes, they could go to a library if they wanted to, if they're able to get there. Yes, they could use an interlibrary loan. Yes, they could fork out £60 for a Palgrave book. Will they, though? Aren't we missing out on a massive opportunity for chance engagement, for that uh, fortuitous moment where somebody hits upon research work they wouldn't otherwise have found, suddenly decides to go study the art history degree they always wished they'd done instead of business management? It strikes me that we have a world coming where every single piece of natural scientific research is going to be available to anybody who wants to read it for free online and they will find things by chance that will save their life if they go into a clinic with a doctor um, or they just find interesting. And if we're not careful, every piece of long-form humanities work will not be accessible in that way. It will be something for which you have to pay. The humanities will be the bastion of privilege against the supposedly democratizing natural sciences. Now, I don't really like that kind of two cultures type of thinking, but that's what I see happening as a dangerous consequence of our inability to solve these economic problems and our unwillingness sometimes to think about what a world of open access books could be in positive terms. And problem number three is about reuse and licensing. I'm not going to say too much on this because my views are known on this, but um, we have problems with photocopying licenses and the fees we pay for those, even for teaching in universities. Um, my type of work, which is a digital humanities approach to contemporary fiction, is often frustrated by um, an inability to conduct text mining. Um, even when we have exemptions under uh, EU law for this, um, there are actually additional barriers in the format that's provided, um, or the fact that DRM can still be applied to something, and getting an exemption requires you to go to the Secretary of State. Well, I'm not going to the Secretary of State to get an exemption for three million academic articles that I want to text mine, um, because that's going to take a little while, and he's not going to care at all. I'm not even sure who he is, given he's probably been fired in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> We also have a problem, again, with public access in the reuse space, which is to do with resources like Wikipedia. Now, whether you think Wikipedia is full of cat videos and is an unreliable source that should be banned from anyone ever reading it or not, is the first place that anyone turns, who isn't an academic, when they want to find out about a subject. So if we think that we have an ignorant world out there um, and we wish that we could do more about it, bringing the standard of Wikipedia up through having sources that are citable, open, verifiable, seems to me an important part of that landscape. And at the moment, monographs don't really fall into that category. Countless times I've looked at Wikipedia articles and thought, why haven't you cited X, Y, and Z? The answer is actually pretty obvious when you think about who edits Wikipedia and what kind of access they have. But that's the state we're in. And we then have questions of translation, and this is, I know, a very sensitive topic. My feeling is that at the moment, most humanities research does not get translated. Um, it stays in its native domain. Uh, it stays in its native tongue as well. And perhaps that's OK in many cases. But I find it frustrating that there might be instances where something has social value, if not economic value, in a translation. And our current conditions of copyright stop people taking good faith measures to do that. Now, whether that's best implied through a license granting it beforehand, or whether we fall back to asking researchers for permission to do it is something that I think is worth compromising on for the sake of getting somewhere with open access monographs. But thinking about our global research ecosystem, the way that English dominates that, and what translation could do for a range of publics we haven't even thought about who don't speak English seems to me an important area for investigation. I want to close by saying a little bit about what we're doing on the COPIM project, which is the Community-Led Open Publication Infrastructures for Monographs Initiative um, that was mentioned earlier. So this is led by Yannicka Adima and Gary Hall at Coventry University. Um, it has partners around the world, from the University of California, Trinity, Trinity College, Cambridge, to my institution, Birkbeck, um, Leicester. We've, we've got uh, tentacles everywhere. Essentially... 
One of the missing parts of the open access system for monographs at the moment is to do with what you might call infrastructural provision. And that's social and technological infrastructure. I'm not talking as a technologist here solely. But at the moment, we have gaps, say, in the uh, systems of discovery for open access monographs. If you can find a book and you can find its full text, that's great. But if you find a book and you don't realize that it has a full text version online, um, then there's not really much advantage to there being an open access copy of that book. If you find that uh, your press is struggling at the moment to come up with a new business model, where is the support? Well, there doesn't seem to have been much except for that Welcome Trust thing recently. I don't know if people saw this, the Information Power Report for Learned Societies. Potentially interesting, but what we actually need is people on the ground to go to learned societies, to go to publishers, to look at their business models, their cash flows in confidence, and suggest them ways, reversible ways, that they can start to experiment with new models that might support open access monographs without the damaging consequences of book processing charges. So part of this project, part that I'm working on, is to reach out to university presses uh, to show them what we've done financially with OLH, to think through what a transition to a new business model would look like for their setup, to build case studies to show how it can be done, and to find library partner willingness to fund new models that will allow our scholarship to be made openly accessible. In other words, to show that other models are available and can be sound. Now, obviously, there's risk involved in any transition of a business model. Um, the more corporate-minded among us might say that any business that has to encounter no risk is not going to be a competitive business in any sense whatsoever. But I think with the impending mandates from Plan S um, and other funder initiatives, we have both carrots and sticks here. And I hope that the carrot is an appealing enough uh, incentive to begin that conversation. The last thing I wanted to say was that Plan S has a monograph component to it. Plan S is the initially pan-European, but now plan, uh, pan-global initiative uh, to accelerate open access to articles initially, but then monographs, a statement forthcoming in 2021 about open access to these forms of output. That's not far away, and we need to get thinking about this. But one of the things I've heard um, that I hope we might get some clarity from, from Research England, uh, is people telling me that, well, you know, this doesn't apply to most research in the UK and the humanities because we're not funded. UKRI, though, is a signatory to the Plan S Declaration. REF is owned by Research England and the devolved funding councils of Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. It's not clear whether REF is in or out, and nobody has made any statement on this. But theoretically, the largest quarter of the funding for REF, Research England, has signed that declaration, and you might expect that they would then apply that mandate to their outputs in future. So I think we have a serious impetus to think this through. And that's where I'm going to stop, because everyone likes a shorter keynote. But thank you very much for your time. I hope that was interesting. I was just wondering how, the, how green open access might, uh, might help mitigate these costs, and how the UK scholarly communications license could be adapted, potentially. Because currently it only applies, or will apply, when it finally gets launched to uh, articles, but could there be scope in the future for extending it to books? So green for books has been discussed extensively in lots of committee meetings. Um, there are challenges of versioning, um, versions of record. Um, it's no different really to the article space except that you're talking at a bigger scale across the work. Um, to my mind, you do have a challenge there if somebody, say, cites something that has been removed from the final version of a book, say part of the fact-checking process, that is a type of publishing labor that a good publisher would invest, says, so actually, you know what, that's not true. That needs to come out. If you had that in a version of record for a, an accepted point, and after which changes, then you've got that citation challenge. I'm not sure how frequently that occurs. You know, there's an interesting text mining project for someone to undertake there if they could get access to a good final corpus versus an accepted manuscript corpus. Um, we also have... You know, perhaps archaic or perhaps valuable traditions that look at page referencing and the way in which you know, the function of the footnote for Anthony Grafton is that chain of epistemic validation. Um, if we can't find the source 
and what it says, then we've got a problem. You could argue that green versions are searchable, though. So actually, if the page reference isn't the same, you've got it. But these are the kind of debates that are going on around green. I think fundamentally, the biggest problem with green open access for books of, of, with an author's accepted manuscript version is that authors really don't like it. And that causes us social problems in getting to a point of consensus where we could do some kind of implementation. Yeah. So for me, there's a, there's a balance between listening to every scholar's opinion and you know, compromising where it's helpful and just saying, actually, you know what, this is a good way of doing it. I haven't seen really much experiment with green open access, but it would be a good thing to do to judge whether the economics are affected. Because obviously the fear is, if you're a book publisher and you put the AAM out, uh, do your sales drop off? Very difficult thing to measure because you need control groups of matched titles. Uh, getting the ANOVA statistics to line up doesn't always work, as the uh, JISC Open UK project discovered. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say no under any circumstance, although we haven't yet got the guidelines and plan S to say what version they're looking at here. Um, but things like the scholarly communication license help us in thinking through the role of green, um, although perhaps has been superseded by the plan S discussions themselves. You know, it's taken a very long time to get them through. Personally, I'd really like to see some green experiments. Um, on two of my books, I proposed green open manuscript copies to Palgrave and Stanford University Press. Both of them declined even with a five-year embargo to allow me to do that. So the fact that, you know, we're talking single title here, and they might have feared that everyone else would ask for it if I did, I don't know. But um, I couldn't get them to agree to that on a single title. So it needs some kind of push with an incentive pull at the same time for publishers who want to experiment here. Um, it seems a like a lot of the good work is being done by smaller publishers uh, in terms of uh, experimenting around sustainable models. Is there any good work being done by big publishers? Uh, well, let me start by just, just acknowledging that, yes, lots of new small startups, often led by scholars themselves, are doing uh, what would be considered radical business practice, trying to rethink economics, where the public good plays a role here, what libraries function in society is and what they pay for infrastructurally. Um, that said, when you run a small startup organization, it's easier to take those risks. Um, so, you know, to, to be fair to CEP, if you have hundreds of employees, um, are you in a position to take an experimental route that uh, could jeopardize the living of, of all those people who are under you? It's a far more difficult decision. Even if you answered yes to that, it's a more difficult decision for them to make. Um, the challenge for me is that most publishers have just gone the route of the book processing charge. Um, it depends what you define as big as well, really. I mean, some, some presses like Punks and Books are winning big prizes. Open Book Publishers has won some awards too, I seem to, to remember. So if you define scale not at volume of material published but on quality, then actually some of the small publishers that we're talking about here could be considered large and are doing those experiments. Um, they're punching above their weight, certainly, in terms of those outputs. But I, I haven't really seen good, say, consortial membership schemes from Springer Nature, Palgrave, or the big uh, university presses. Um, I mean, the other thing I haven't really touched on as well is the internationalism of the challenge here, that um, Plan S helps by giving international coordination and a synchronized move, whereas before it's always been argued that the UK is going it alone. You really struggle, though, to get that working in the States. You do not have a strongly federated system of research funding as a mandatory lever to change practice. So, you know, to get Stanford University Press to consider open access becomes much more of a challenge. And scholars still cling to that because it comes with such prestigious reputational gains to be published by Princeton, Yale, Harvard, et cetera, that you continue to seek out those venues over and above um, funding demands. So that's kind of where we, we've got to with COPIM and the section I'm leading there is maybe not, we're not talking CUP and OUP style scale here, but what about the medium learned society and university press publishers who are already established, uh, are valued by their academic constituents. What can we do to give them the final bit of help they need to reconfigure their business models and to try something 
in a way that, if it doesn't work, doesn't put them under, um, but also, but if it does work, really opens up a promising avenue, and they can say that they were among the first to try it. I should say, lots of big publishers participated in Knowledge Unlatched. Now, that may be because they get essentially the income they would have got from a book processing charge, so there's no risk or experiment in a way, but it was considered quite radical to put your books into Knowledge Unlatched at the beginning, and Francis Pinter spent over a decade uh, getting that off the ground. So no matter what you think of their transition to a for-profit structure now, I think we should continue to give credit to them for seeing that ahead of the curve and doing something about it. We just now have to ensure that the reputation of that model isn't tarnished by the fact that it was sold and became a for-profit entity. This is a question from relative ignorance. In these various modelings, from the point of view of publishers and from the point of view of authors, how much difference, if any, is there about whether or not one tries to imagine future models in which a physical object still or is also produced? Um, both, I'm thinking here both in a way about what one of the complications of author by, and speaking as a medieval historian who has a lot of books and who likes the physical object, but, but also actually more seriously about the, you know, one of the things about physical codexes is that there's a different kind of legacy preservation system there as well. Okay, so yes, yeah, so there's a lot in that question. I should, should point out that the building in which I work, 43 Gordon Square, had a room collapse under the weight of books from offices built above teaching rooms in recent months, and now we have about three million quid of repairs to take, take on. So these damaging physical objects are very costly to us. Um, so there has not been the suggestion that we remove the physical copies of books. Essentially, um, for the last 30 years, almost all book publishing has been digital before it's been print, and the print has been um, a knock-on artifact from the digital master copy that is created. And this means that actually the unit costs to create a single item of print are relatively low. So many of my books are open access, and they all have print copies with them. Um, if a better technology than the codex comes along for random and sequential access, then perhaps that problem would be solved in some ways because actually you wouldn't need your book that you have the spatial memory of that you navigate in a different way to a digital copy on a screen. Uh, but at the moment, all author surveys as well indicate that if you're going to read 80,000 words or more, you don't want to do it on a backlit screen. We know that um, eye-tracking experiments show that people phys physiologically react differently to backlit screens and reading an F-shaped pattern rather than uh, the more um, involved reading that you get on paper. I don't know whether that's a socially conditioned phenomenon brought about by the internet and attention spans or whether it is actually a physical property of our interaction with that media form, but there is a difference. Um, in terms of legacy preservation, that's a really interesting question. Um, so we're quite good at preserving digital artifacts that are static and book-like at the moment. We do exactly the same thing that we do with copies of books. We get as many copies of them in as many different places as we can, and we ensure a continuous power supply to those regions because otherwise the print volumes decay when the airflow gets in and the humidity levels rise, um, and the digital copies decay because you can't boot the computer that it's on to actually access the material. What we're not good at um, doing is digital preservation of singular artifacts with unique media qualities. So this is why I often try not to get too involved in discussions about what the book could become in an open access or purely digital world versus we've got a thing we call a book that has a relatively well-defined form for several centuries now um, in print. What do we do just to get that version in a digital environment and then open before we start thinking about the complexities of new media format, the complexities of preservation that that brings with it at the same time. Now, some things are quite easy, actually. You know, there are standards for videos if you, if you want to do that. But some people come up with the most idiosyncratic ideas for long-form writing in the humanities. You know, there are digital humanities projects that essentially, if you wanted to preserve them, would require employing someone for the next 100 years to check every day that this thing was still accessible across the range of the latest browser software every time it's updated, you know, that the server infrastructure is in place, and so on. And basically, you get a, a curve of diminishing returns where uh, the fewer of the types of artifact there are, 
the higher the cost. It's that immensely steep curve back to one being your entire cost for preservation as opposed to a long tail of book-like artefacts in PDF that we, we know what to do with. So, yeah, thanks, Martin. I thought that was a really nice summary. Um, I like that. I, I'm, I'm just wondering if you, um, I mean, we're here to talk about books, but I'm wondering if there have been any, anything you see in how open access has been applied to journals, which is like a, a kind of a negative role model. Things have been tried there that, you know, sanitary lessons. Like article processing charges, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, genuinely, that is a huge problem. Um, it's really, the, the last few months have seen an increasing criticism of the economic models applied to the journal space from even within the natural sciences. So really interesting are the criticisms coming from South America in particular. So, um, you know, one of the long-standing arguments for open access is that we have a globally unequal world and this comes with epistemic injustice in access to information as well and that the global south, which is a term some like and others don't, um, are disproportionately disadvantaged. But actually, uh, many from the Global South now view open access through article processing charges as just a reinvestment in the systems of exclusion from the opposite perspective. You know, not that huge numbers of researchers from Mexico, for instance, succeed in making it into top um, Anglo-American journals. But that, that business model is, ca is causing and has caused all through the debate huge reputational damage to open access as a potentially noble cause that it could be. So that's, that's the first one, and that's the, the book processing charge argument that I've outlined here is basically just what happens if you blow up that problem by a factor of eight for each artifact that you're talking about um, in a funding climate where the funding is eight times less. It's that kind of proportionate problem. Um, I think also there's been a lot of debate about Licensing, I know Peter's in the room today and we've had debates about this before. I've softened my views on licensing over the years. I can see huge benefits in Creative Commons open licensing, but I also think that we could spend a lifetime having these arguments and that coming to the point where people can redistribute manuscripts on a non-derivative basis could be a practical compromise that gives us the greatest benefits in dissemination, and ensuring that work is preserved in as many locations as possible, um, while having some degree of openness, it's not CC BY, but we need the scholarly community to want to do this, and you know, if people want their work to be more openly licensed, they can be the ones to be the guinea pigs and to be the case studies that could show us the evidence base for whether or not this is a good idea. So we do have a good evidence base from the sciences that more liberal licensing doesn't cause huge reputational damage. What causes reputational damage is Andrew Wakefield publishing fraudulent research material in The Lancet. Um, but the humanities disciplines want their own material to be vetted. It, you know, the uses of history and literature and culture are perhaps different to the uses of natural scientific information. So I, I think, yes, we can learn a lot from how the open access debate has played out. I think we also learn a lot um, in seeing how compromises were reached within that to get to a point that's far better than a decade ago in terms of open access for journals. Uh, there are lots of people who are so pessimistic about the progress of open access. And yes, if, if you'd been advocating for it in 2002, you'd think it was incredibly slow that we'd only got to a point where you know, still under 50% is available, et cetera. But it's a huge increase and the momentum is growing and acceptance is growing, and the idea that we don't lose quality when things are available openly is growing. All these things are positive, and I think we need to take those positives, articulate them from the start, and see where that takes us, rather than reinventing the wheel, having the same arguments, the same debates, and ending up in the same place, probably, but 20 years from now, rather than in the next decade. Thanks, Martin. That was a fascinating summary and talk. I'm just wondering if you... We're all in the business of the democratization of knowledge. Do you think the crowdfunding model has any potential in relation to open access? I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, I'm not sure we are all in the business of democratizing knowledge, but um, all right, let's assume, let's take that as a premise. So the challenge is that what you don't want is for scholarship to have to become populist. Um, our advances in knowledge are gained by niche subdomains and niche subdisciplines having the freedom to investigate the topics that 
um, are guided by researcher choice. Um, you know, funding streams such as QR in this country, the ongoing stream, facilitate that kind of uh, time investment where we can select the topics we feel are important and we get gradual advances. Perhaps we have moments of epistemic break, but for the most part, not every piece of work is a Nobel Prize winner. Um, so the challenge is that the current model of scholarly communications purchasing frees scholars from the impetus to cater to a market. And that's really important. All right, yes, when you pitch a book to a publisher, you do need to show that they can sell enough copies to make it viable. But a good uh, university press or learned society publisher, for instance, should be making two calls, which is, one, if we publish this work, are we going to go bankrupt? You know, is, it, is it really something on which there's no possibility of us recouping the costs or making any money? And two, is the scholarship really important? And that should be a process of peer review or, you know, there are calls that actually this isn't the best way to do it, but that's what good presses should be doing at the moment, I feel. The challenge is then, so that, that gives you an interesting model. What if, what if university presses were cost centers rather than revenue centers? If universities treated their presses as outlets for dissemination and funded them internally, you really would even remove that economic consideration from what presses did, and they would be able to evaluate purely on the scholarship. And that would be sort of my ideal model for how this could be done. If you're talking about crowdfunding, though, in a really generalized sense of anybody who wants to read this can pay to fund either its production or after the fact to support um, its publication costs, then you introduce a very different set of market relations between the academic producer um, and the end audience and any intermediary like a publisher or press. And I, I fear that essentially the condition you'd instigate there is one in which um, everybody has to write in my field about David Foster Wallace because he's an author with a massive fan base who will also read the academic criticism because they're geeky white men who like this stuff, you know it would start to change what I actually did as research practice in a way that to me is unacceptable for reasons of academic freedom. And that's where I really think academic freedom and open access do interact is when we start talking about how we change economic models and what that does for the choice of what I choose to investigate and what pressures there are on me to conform to something. I mean, so the last book I wrote was uh, a computational study of David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas. It's a single close reading of a novel. Um, I thought there was going to be no press interest in this whatsoever because, right, good luck. What you actually need is a massive survey so that you can get it on as many undergraduate courses as possible. Actually, the first press I went to took it. The economic considerations were not hugely factored in there, and that's a real benefit of what we have at the moment. So... What I've, what I've proposed and what I've implemented at our publisher is a limited type of crowdfunding model. It just so happens that the crowd are information professionals, librarians who have been clamoring for open access for two decades for the most part uh, and who are used to funding scholarship for which they realize there's a limited audience but that it's important exists. And finding mission-driven crowds of specific types of individual who appreciate the sensitivities of the system and whose mission is to support that research production seems to me a potentially promising route. But general crowds, I'd prefer that they did not have an economic say in what we choose to investigate in universities. Although you could argue that QR funding and impact already does that. I think we'll leave it there for now. So I think everyone could thank Martin for his wonderful talk. Thank you.